many years and um, I also uh, work in the Royal College of Psychiatrists as chair of the London Division. Um, and I've been to Pakistan quite a few times. Yes. So I think that uh, there's, I'm not sure, there's 16 people here. Yeah, yes. So please tell me if any of you can't hear or any problems. And um, I think, um, do you have the PowerPoint available? Yeah, yes, Professor, I can share the PowerPoint in the WhatsApp group. Yes, um, please. Yes. And the only question is how, how to change the pages. Okay, uh, okay, uh, I will show you. Uh, okay. Slide, please. It's a complex thing because mental illness is some of the signs and symptoms, but it also can be related to your society and culture and experiences and your socioeconomic status. So defining it is very difficult to define mental illness. You can define it by the behavior we see. People with mental illness, um, like you might see someone with a severe mental illness shouting in the market. You might see them neglecting themselves. It might be abnorm abnormalities of subjective experiences. When someone feels very low in their mood, for example, or very anxious. But it is, one thing is to think about is whether these are distinct categories or a continuum. Um, in psychiatry, we tend to go with categories or extremes um, rather than thinking of it as a continuum. Some of the conditions are on a continuum to normality. So all of us can experience anxiety, stress, depression, that can be obsessive symptoms, all that can be a level of normality going on to a condition if it causes functional impairment. Next slide. Yes, true. Um, so where is the point between mental illness and normality? I've kind of given you the answer already in my last uh, the last thing I said, uh, but what do you think, where does it go between mental illness or normality? Would anyone like to answer that? Sorry, sir, can you repeat the question? Oh. Well, what is the point between mental illness and normality? How would you distinguish that? If the thing is under the uh, societal uh, society of norms, so we can say that it is normal and it is away from the society norms. Maybe it's uh, abnormal for this. Or is acceptable in the society? Acceptable in the society. Okay. Um, but it can be. It, it's there's no clear answer. Um, and for example, there have been conditions that have been mental illnesses that are now no longer defined as mental illnesses. For example, uh, there was one condition that stopped being a mental disorder overnight. I think that was in the 80s, which was homosexuality. Suddenly, worldwide, that stopped becoming a mental illness and became a uh, aspect of normal human existence. Um, so that was a where there is a lot be a lot of cultural factors as well because that would be quite different between England, Britain and Pakistan for example. So it one of the joys of psychiatry and mental health is there can be a lot of discussion and philosophy about these things. Next slide. So the next question is 
with all this complications and confusion and lack of clarity, uh, why do we classify? If you have a broken leg, that's very, very clear. If you have um, tuberculosis, you diagnose it by x-ray, by looking at the sputum, it's very clear. Even COVID diagnosis is very clear because you get a positive result in a laboratory. But not so easy but mental health. Some people say it doesn't value us to, doesn't make a value to make a diagnosis. But why do we classify? Well, it makes things easier for us. So, for example, if I was ringing you about a patient I'm seeing, if I give you the diagnosis, you will understand by that one word the symptoms that might be likely, the um, prognosis, the treatment. It conveys a lot of information. The problem can be, it isn't always so clear. Um, so in psychiatry, as I said, we're very quick to have a category or a diagnosis because it makes it so much easier. Uh, so we have this knowledge group together. We have distinct symptoms for each diagnosis. So it's a useful shortcut but also because we know that uh, if you have a diagnosis, there'll be a certain treatment and there will be a prognosis. Now, from any of you, what do you think about classifying? From a psycholog psychologist's perspective, do you have the same need to classify? Uh, yes, okay. Professor, we have a need to classify the disorders. We will divide them who is uh, 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 that is from uh, neurosis, uh, from psychosis. Uh, we will we will be declassify the same group, say uh, same group of disorder we have classified into the same thing. And okay. but in psychology as well, uh, like some of the classifications you see, like things that you might do, like might be IQ testing. Yeah. You test the intelligence quotient. Yeah. So that might be the yeah. thing. There's things that are used as well, like scales. Yes. Like PHQ-9. Do you know PHQ-9 test? Yes, for measuring the depression. Yes. So yes. that's something that you fill in, and if you score above something, it tells yes. you you have depression. Yes. Um, psychiatrists don't tend to use that so much, but uh, in my country, most of the primary care doctors use something like PHQ-9 all the time. I suspect psychologists, you use scales a lot more for your diagnosis. So the, this slide I've got up now is um, diagnosis. Having a clear diagnosis helps us convey information easily, but it's based on symptoms, not etiology. There's no blood test or x-ray for schizophrenia. Yes. Something like schizophrenia is based on symptoms. Of course, of course, there are some ways of testing this, like with the PSE uh, scale. I've forgotten what, that's, what that stands for at the moment. PSE, present state examination, I think. So that might give you a score for for example, picking up psychosis. Um, so diagnosis in mental health, different to physical health, because it, um, it uh, is looking at quite a wide range of things, behaviors, emotions, and thinking or cognition. And it is, we try and match our patients 
into that category. And that can be very difficult. When we can't do it, it's very, it's very difficult for psychiatrists because then you're not sure about the treatment, the prognosis, um, and the possible causes. Next slide. So the advantages of diagnosis are that you get a clear idea of prognosis. So for example, if you were diagnosing someone with schizophrenia, you might re remember that uh, a third of people get better. 10% have a terrible outcome and the rest have an, in, 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 an intermediate outcome. Prognosis might be helpful for depression if you know that the natural cycle of a depression is about uh, nine months on average. So if you don't do anything, the depression will go away after nine months. But in terms of prognosis, it's likely to come back. So when you're managing the person, you need to talk about how you can reduce the risk of this condition coming back. Um, so the next uh, helps in terms of having a clear treatment plan. So for example, if someone has depression as a condition, the treatment would be um, from a psychiatrist, we'd look at the treatments of medication, and then we would look at the social treatments and the psychological treatments. We would, we would ask our psychology colleagues to lead, I suspect, on the psychology treatments in terms of the sorts of treatments that you have. And in Pakistan, I, I, I'm not sure uh, for, for the people here today, but you have cognitive behavioral therapy? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you have IPT, interpersonal therapy? Uh, no, sorry, this is not uh, use ITP. So for the main psychological treatment for depression would be... Um, a cognitive a therapy, a behavioral therapy. therapy. Uh, although, although it is known that uh, IPT can be very, very effective as well. So having a diagnosis and evidence can point out that the treatment, uh, different treatments. So for example, if you find out that IPT is very effective, you might look at using that when you have made the diagnosis. Uh, it helps explanation. And this is really helpful. Um, so that ordinary, the community, people can understand what the diagnosis is. So um, important part of making a diagnosis is explaining it to the patient and their family. And having a diagnosis helps that. Now the other thing is demystifying mental illness. Having a diagnosis puts a label on it. It means that you're able to say this is the condition. And often, I find that people will say, this really helped me having a diagnosis. I have examples, for example, where I've told a parent that their child had autism, which is a really bad, difficult diagnosis, but it really, really helped the parent that there was a name for it and a label for it. Um, demystifying mental illness. Um, for example, um, I had someone contact me this week, uh, one of my colleagues who was having terrible, terrible panic attacks because of this lockdown and COVID. So I was able to explain that her diagnosis was a panic attack and it made it much easier for her. She was able, it stopped any mystery or magic. I, had, I told her you are not mad. You do not need to be in hospital. So it can be really helpful and taking away all the sorts of myths about mental illness. If you have a proper diagnosis and explain it well. Next slide. Yes. 
Okay, but with that, there's disadvantages. And um, I know that some of my psychology colleagues in this country and psychiatrists don't like giving diagnoses because yes. they feel that it will be um, that it's labeling or causing stigma. Uh, in this country, in the UK, we have a lot of issues about diagnosing black people with schizophrenia. And people will say this is like uh, racism or discrimination. Um, there's also other things like we will see people that we would diagnose as schizophrenia. If they go to, for example, I've seen cases where people went to the private sector got a diagnosis of bipolar disorder because they kind of preferred that. Or people will say psychosis because a word like schizophrenia is very powerful and people think that you're a mad person and this will stop you moving on in your life. Um, if you have a diagnosis of some conditions, you carry it like a burden around with you. Um, in some countries, um, if you have a psychiatric disorder, you get registered officially in the country and that can stop you getting certain jobs or um, it can really affect your, your prospects in life. The other thing about diagnosis is oversimplific it's oversimplification. So if you have depression, for example, you need to know more about that. Um, is the depression because someone is poor, they've got no money, they've got domestic violence, they've got all these social problems, they maybe have physical health problems like diabetes, etc. So a single diagnosis doesn't capture all of that. So it's oversimplification. The other issue is diagnosis with diagnosis is it medicalizes so it makes it uh if you give a, a diagnosis it's kind of saying this is the same as a broken leg it's the same as diabetes whereas mental illness can be a little bit different because it's uh it's about the mind the body the soul and the social environment and um, it is a problem. You give someone a diagnosis of something, it stays with them for their life. Um, the diagnosis can be unreliable. So you may get one diagnosis from one health professional and a, a different diagnosis from another. Um, you know, pe people will ask for different um, different. Uh, health workers to diagnose them because they're not happy with the answer so um people will not want as i said before the example of people not, not wanting the example of schizophrenia uh sometimes i will say we'll say well maybe you don't have schizophrenia maybe you have schizoaffective disorder um some people say well my patients sometimes tell me i don't have schizoaffective disorder I have bipolar disorder. So you've got to be clear on how to make sure that your diagnosis is as reliable as possible. The other thing that diagnosis takes away from is picking up comorbidity. Um, so if you just have one diagnosis, you kind of think the person has that diagnosis and you forget about the other um, issues like um, um, with other physical health conditions. For example, conditions like Parkinson's disease have a 40% rate of depression. Similarly for tuberculosis, there's a lot of comorbidity, which a simple diagnosis wouldn't pick up. So there are all these disadvantages versus the advantages. Are there any questions about that? I think, Professor, everything is clear right now. But uh, okay. if I could ask, please. So, 
psychologists may have a different sort of perspective, and social workers particularly may have a different perspective on this, because they might see that we're labeling too much and giving people a secondary handicap of a diagnosis that prevents them integrating into life. Um, like if you have a diagnosis of autism, for example, it might prevent you being included in the community. Your family may say this person has a mental, as a disorder, so they can't be invited to the family wedding. They can't go to the market and things like this. Yes. Next slide, please. Yes. So now we have different types of classification that have come up over the years. Um, I've kind of mentioned the main one that we use these days, which is categorical. We put something into a category. But um, there's some useful ways of conceptualizing diagnosis. There's organic and functional. Organic diagnosis means that there's something physically wrong with the person, that you can find something in their brain or whatever. This is like the person has a brain tumor, they have um, um, multiple sclerosis or something that affects their behavior and you can look at it on a brain scan or blood tests. Now that's organic. The other side is functional. So functional is when there isn't that physical cause uh, known. So for example, schizophrenia is our depression are defined as functional illnesses. But it's not a terribly satisfactory thing because if you do a brain scan in someone with schizophrenia, you'll find that their brain is quite different. Um, in depression, you might find that the, the chemistry is different to someone with depression. So there does mean that there is some organic aspect to this as well. So this distinction is a little bit difficult now. Also in Pakistan, you see a lot of functional disorders uh, where people have conversion disorders or hysteria. So these are conditions where you've got physical conditions, but there's no physical cause. So it's not organic. Um, and these can be very uh, challenging to treat. Um, but you have to make sure you exclude all possible physical or organic causes for these. So my job as a psychiatrist is my First job is always, always to make sure that I check for any organic or physical cause. Yes. Once that's eliminated, then I look, I, I say this is functional. I have got it wrong at times. I, I remember a case of someone who was, uh, she had, we diagnosed her as schizophrenia. Another case we diagnosed her as bipolar. And then when we did a brain scan on those two people, we found that they had um, a brain tumor. So this was organic. The yes. other traditional classification is psychosis neurosis. versus neurosis. Now, psychosis is uh, very much my job in, as a psychiatrist. I see a lot of psychosis conditions where people have conditions like hear, symptoms like hearing voices, bizarre behaviors, or um, false beliefs. Bipolar disorder can have these things as well. Neurosis is like anxiety, obsessive symptoms. And neurosis can be considered as an exaggerated exaggeration of normal, it's on a continuum. Whereas psychosis is not a continuum from normal. So with neurosis, we all can experience anxiety, we all can experience depression, we all can experience 
uh, obsessive symptoms, uh, depersonalization, derealization, um, stress symptoms. These are all neurosis, but if we start to have psychosis with false beliefs and voices, that's beyond normality, beyond that continuum. Now, going to the next line here, ICD and DSM-5. This is the main modern classification system that, that uh, we use in our, in our mental health services around the world. And in Pakistan, I think you use DSM. Yes, in DSM. Mostly psychologists use DSM. DSM, okay. And uh, this is a system, both of them are pretty similar in a way. ICD is created by WHO, and yeah. um, they, um, this is what I use normally, but I've been trained in DSM, which we used in Australia, where I trained there. And in USA, DSM is used there. They both put conditions into categories based on symptoms, yes. and sometimes about natural history, etc. Um, now, the next thing is formulations. So, this is another way of classifying, which is describing each person and their particular symptoms. So, I might say uh, a patient I'm seeing at the moment, she has the formulation of this patient is she is a 60 year old woman whose husband died in December of last year. She has experienced symptoms of schizophrenia over many years, which are now worsened by these stresses. Um, she has suicidal feelings and low mood, uh, which are more than could be seen by her grief. She also has low economic status, and is socially isolated. Now, that's, I think that's a nice way to put things. You give a little story about your patient, which captures their physical health, their mental health, and their social situation. In the former, um, in the older editions of DSM, they had that as a multi-axial system where people had different axes. Uh, there was an axis for psychosis, an axis for neurosis, an axis for social difficulties, and an axis for functioning. Um, it meant that you got a very full picture of people. So if I was referring to my psychology colleague for treatment, I would be able to give that story to them, which might be more helpful than just this lady has schizoaffective disorder. Next slide, please. Yes. Professor, we have four minutes left almost. Oh, okay. So let's go. I, I, I've actually covered this as well when we're talking. Just move on to next. Or, or, or we will, if you are free tomorrow, we will continue this lecture tomorrow. Well, okay. just move, we can just move on quite quickly to the slides. Just uh, which slide? Uh, just moving on and um, moving on. I've covered that moving on. Oh, yeah. So this is interesting. Diagnostic hierarchy. So first thing we always have to pick out is organic. We have to make sure the organic is gone. I think that uh, the time is limited. So um, I just want to check if there's any questions from people. Any question? No, no, sir. Not, not yet. Okay. So just going on in the slides, just move on, please. I'll just raise my finger every time to move on. Okay, move on. Uh, move on. Move on. Yes, yes, yes. Move on. Uh, okay. So now I've just given an example of a case. So this is a case I got from Power. And this one, you would want to see how you would diagnose. Is it psychosis or neurosis? And then you could look at how you would use ICD. We have limited time to go through that. Next slide. 
Okay. Now, okay, we'll finish with this. Uh, we haven't had so much time. But, okay, true or false? There is a continuum from psychosis to normality. True or false? False. False, false sir. ICD is the classification system of WHO. Yes, right. sir, true. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is written by the American Psychiatric Association. So, yes, sir. Yes. True. Okay. Easy questions. In ICD, Z codes are mental disorders. Yes, sir. Don't no. know, sir. False. No, sir. False. 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 They're kind of like other social issues or whatever. Stress is a mental health disorder. No, true. sir. No. Uh, no, it's not true. Uh, psychiatric population gives me giving the psychiatric diagnosis. True. No, sir. It's false. Psychiatric formulations, no? For formulations. It's much more. It's about the physical, the mental, the social, and the context. Which yes. is a screening tool for depression and primary care? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. True. True. Okay. So maybe those were a bit easy. Yes. Um, so I think that I'll now just maybe time for a question. Any question? Sir, last slide, true or false, fully open. Second last true or false, Jutha, is Kuzara explain. Psychiatric formulation, formulation means giving to psychiatric diagnosis. Yeah, I think that uh, I've kind of put it's possibly true, but psychiatric diagnosis and more. So if the person has a diagnosis of depression, uh, they're socially isolated, they have uh, tuberculosis, it means putting it more of a story. They live alone. Uh, their husband died a year ago. That's a psychiatric formulation. So it gives you more of a picture. So for a psychologist, you could work with that and how you would treat that person because uh, you would see their um, different problems. Yes. Uh, sir, in the UK, the psychiatrist and psychologist are working together or they are working separate, se separately? Okay. Um, in the past, people used to say like psychiatrists and psychologists were like cats and dogs. Yes, the same here in Pakistan. Okay, but it's um, it's different now. Um, in my place, we work closely with our psychologist. I do, for example, staff.